Hey everyone, Ryan here, and welcome to our last video of the oral surgery series. Second only to the surgery aspect of oral surgery, medical emergencies is the most important part of this entire series with regards to what's tested on the board exam. So we're going to talk about several different medical emergencies that can happen in the dental clinic and how you manage them focusing only on the high yield facts. And I have a lot of acronyms that I hope help you to remember these high yield facts come test day. So this is my favorite acronym and it's applicable in almost every single emergency. And that is SPORT, which stands for stop treatment, position the patient, oxygen, with a little asterisk here because there's an exception where you don't want to use oxygen, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Reassure, so reassure the patient, reassure your staff, reassure yourself, reassure everybody, and to take vitals. So again, I love this acronym because it's applicable in almost every situation, and it virtually presents the, the proper order in which you would respond to a medical emergency. And the idea for me to remember the high yield facts, not only for the board exam, but also in real life, when you have a medical emergency happen in the chair, it tends to bring up a lot of emotions and adrenaline runs high. And it's nice to be able to recall certain acronyms and things that you can re remember right off the top of your head to respond appropriately. So with this framework in mind, Let's dive into some examples of medical emergencies. So the first one is syncope. Another word for syncope is fainting. So the patient would often feel warm at first, then feel cold. Their blood pressure and heart rate would eventually go down, and then they would fall unconscious. And this is the most common medical emergency in the dental chair. Vasovagal syncope is the most common form of fainting, and it's often related to a needle anxiety. So for people who are very afraid of getting an injection, this syncope is often stress-related. So vasovagal syncope, which is named because of the, the feeling of malaise, is mediated by the vagus nerve, or cranial nerve number 10. And so this is related to a stress response. The best medical management in this case is to position the patient properly. And Trendelenburg is a supine position, which I show here, in which the table or the chair is tilted with the patient's head down. So the patient's head is lower than their feet. And the idea is to actually get their head below their heart level to help facilitate blood flow to the brain. Now there's one caveat to this, and that is if the patient is pregnant, to use instead of Trendelenburg, use the left lateral decubitus position. And this is to have the patient lay on their left side so that the fetus does not compress the inferior vena cava which runs along the back of the body towards the right side. So you don't want to use Trendelenburg in that case. You want to use left lateral decubitus for a pregnant patient. There's also another form of syncope called orthostatic hypotension. And this is the second most common cause of syncope. It's also colloquially known as dizzy spell or head rush. And this is where your blood pressure suddenly drops when standing up really quickly. So this one's not related to stress. And again, it's caused by quickly standing up and it's a failure of the baroreceptor reflex to mediate peripheral resistance. So essentially a patient who is lying back in the chair for a really long time, especially if they're dehydrated, and then you sit them up really fast and they stand up right away, that's not a good mix and is a recipe for orthostatic hypotension. Again another form of syncope or fainting. Epinephrine overdose. This is a rare medical emergency. It's due to rapid 
intravascular or IV injection of local anesthetic with epinephrine. So this is the exact opposite reaction from syncope. Here you get blood pressure and heart rate going up and you have a thumping heart reaction. And the important things to note here is the principles I talked about in our local anesthetics video that you have to calculate the proper dose of local anesthetic and epinephrine, you aspirate before you inject, and then you inject very slowly. If you do and follow those things, epinephrine overdose is not something you have to worry about. Next is angina. Angina is chest pain as a result of the coronary arteries not being able to provide enough oxygenated blood to the heart tissue. So we have two main forms of angina. There's stable, that's when the angina, the chest pain symptoms, are caused by some stimulus like exercise, stress, something like that. Unstable angina is when you have chest pain, but it's less predictable, and the chest pain can occur even at rest. Angina is ischemia without necrosis, so the heart is not getting enough oxygenated blood, but fortunately, none of the heart tissue or the heart cells are dying as a result of it. How do you manage this medical emergency? I use the acronym ONA, which stands for oxygen, nitroglycerin, and aspirin. So what do we do? Again, sport, we stop treatment, we position the patient, we would sit them upright in this case, we would give them oxygen, we would reassure them and take vitals. And for this medical emergency, after oxygen, we would administer a nitroglycerin tablet or spray. So if we're using a nitroglycerin, that's NTG for short, let's say we're using a tablet that's typically delivered sublingually under the tongue, and it's a 0.4 milligram dose. Now if the pain the chest pain does not go away in five minutes, you give them a second dose of nitroglycerin. You wait another five minutes, and if the pain does not go away, then you give them a third dose of nitroglycerin. And at that point, you would give them a dose of aspirin and call EMS or call 911 because at this point, you're now presuming the situation is not improving and it's likely a heart attack, which we'll talk about in the next slide. The reason we use aspirin is to prevent blood clot and prevent and to facilitate blood flow to the heart, and nitroglycerin is a nitrate, and it works via vasodilation. So again, it's allowing more oxygenated blood to reach the heart by dilating the coronary arteries, which is what the heart desperately needs. It desperately needs oxygen in order to function in this situation because it's not getting enough. So I was just alluding to it, myocardial infarction, or MI for short, is more commonly known as a heart attack. And so this is when angina progresses to ischemia with necrosis or with some death of heart cells and heart tissue. It's caused by a sudden occlusion or blockage of a major coronary vessel, usually the left anterior descending artery, or the LAD, which again will lead to heart cell necrosis. So for this medical emergency management, we add, we tack on one additional letter to our ONA acronym, and we make it MONA. So this stands for morphine, oxygen, nitroglycerin, and aspirin. So morphine is a painkiller, and it's actually a bit controversial, and it's not recommended by everybody, but it was historically part of the routine medical management for an MI. So ONA is the same as we did for angina, we're just adding morphine to this list. So for the board exam, those are helpful acronyms to keep in the back of your head. Next we have hypoglycemia slash diabetes. So medical management for diabetes is often trying to keep the blood sugar levels managed and low with insulin therapy. But in a dental care setting, we're more concerned with risk for emergency 
via the blood sugar being too low. And so there's this great little image I found on dailyhealthpost.com that details the six cardinal symptoms for hypoglycemia, the blood sugar being too low, and hyperglycemia, the blood sugar being too high. And it certainly doesn't hurt to know these if you have some room in your brain to memorize these. So for hypoglycemia, the cardinal symptoms are sweating, also known as diaphoresis, pallor, irritability, hunger, lack of coordination, and sleepiness. For hyperglycemia, too much blood sugar, you typically experience dry mouth, increased thirst, weakness, headache, blurred vision, and frequent urination. So if the patient is experiencing these hypoglycemia symptoms and they're diabetic, and they typically will know this or alert you because they're used to feeling these symptoms if their blood sugar is not being managed properly, if they're conscious, you can give them a glucose tab or orange juice, something with sugar to help raise their sugar, their blood sugar level. But if they're unconscious, then you have to resort to doing an IV injection of dextrose or an IM, which is intramuscular injection of glucagon. And this is, again, to help control the blood sugar levels. Now, a patient with diabetes undergoing conscious IV sedation, you should tell them to still have some food, have a low calorie meal, and decrease their insulin dose appropriately. So everything has to be balanced with a diabetic. You can't just not eat and then take the same amount of insulin that you normally do every day. That's where you can run into trouble with hypoglycemia. So you should titrate and manage your insulin dose and your food intake, calorie intake appropriately. All right, so let's talk about some lung issues now. And the first being hyperventilation. So hyperventilation is when you breathe uncontrollably, both fast and deep, which results in too much oxygen and not enough carbon dioxide in your blood. So this is the one medical emergency you absolutely do not want to give oxygen to the patient because you'll just make things worse. So for this patient, again, sport, stop treatment, position them appropriately. Again, we'll sit them upright in this case. We're not giving them oxygen. That's where that asterisk came in. We reassure them, take vitals. And for hyperventilation specifically, we want to give them a paper bag. And while they're sitting upright, have them breathe into the brown paper bag to recycle and restore a proper balance of carbon dioxide. So symptoms with this often feel lightheaded, dizzy, weak, and not be able to think straight. And so having a brown paper bag handy can certainly help and alleviate the symptoms and to deal with hyperventilation. Asthma, another very common respiratory medical emergency or condition. Asthma results in constriction and inflammation of the bronchioles, which can lead to an asthma attack, which would be considered a medical emergency. So asthma can make it difficult to both inhale and exhale, but wheezing is a cardinal sign. And wheezing is this high pitch on exhale. So what do you do with an asthma attack? Typically would take two puffs from an emergency inhaler which is almost always albuterol. And albuterol works to relax the smooth muscle around the bronchioles, to, to, so to battle this constriction and to allow proper oxygen flow. So an asthma attack can be triggered by stress, can be triggered by exercise, it can be triggered by cold, it can be triggered by many different things. So getting an accurate and comprehensive health history from the patient, figuring out when they've used their emergency inhaler in the past, why they used it, what situation they were in, was it ever caused in a dental setting, knowing all of those things and making sure they have their inhaler with them are really critical to dealing with and managing a potential asthma attack. 
For these patients, you want to avoid NSAIDs like aspirin and ibuprofen and narcotics like oxycodone, which can trigger asthma. So airway obstruction. Hands around the neck is the universal choking sign. And so what do we do if a patient aspirates something? A, dent a dental instrument, like an endophile, or a tooth that was extracted. Of course, you should be using a rubber dam, an endo, and having a throat shield to prevent extracted teeth from being aspirated. But if these things happen, what do we do? So first we want to clear the pharynx of any food, vomit, or in this case, foreign objects. Check for breathing, so rise and fall of the chest, sound of the mouth or nose. Do a chin tilt, so tilt the chin upwards to extend the neck and also protrude the tongue and mandible to open that airway up. So these are all the best management tools for dealing with a choking victim. Seizure and convulsions. So what do we do? if a patient begins to seize. So you might have heard this already, but you want to let them seize. You don't restrain them, but you also want to protect them from injury. So if possible, get things out of their mouth and protect them as best they can to prevent injury. You can administer an IV or IM benzodiazepine. And for specific, specifically, for a grand mal seizure, which is the most common seizure, it's the classic tonic-clonic seizure, typically lasts two to three minutes, you would give Dilantin or Phenytoin. Those are the same thing, one's the brand name and one's the chemical name. For status epilepticus, epilepticus, that is a seizure that lasts for more than five minutes. And so for this one, we would administer Valium or diazepam. Again, they're the same thing. One's the trade name, one's the chemical name. So that's for seizures and convulsions. So next we have stroke. So there are two main types uh, or categories of stroke. We can talk about the TIA, which stands for transient ischemic accident. And this is a mini stroke. So it's a stroke that only lasts for a few minutes and when blood supply to part of the brain is briefly blocked. A CVA is a cerebrovascular accident, and this refers to a typical normal stroke when blood flow to the brain is stopped either by a blockage, which is called an ischemic stroke, or rupture of a blood vessel, which is called a hemorrhagic stroke. So in this case, you want to give the patient oxygen and call 911 immediately. It can be caused by a number of things, one of them being hyponatremia. This has been asked on the board exam. This is when you have low sodium in the blood, and it can be caused or be a result of a stroke. Some cardinal signs to look for is facial droop, arm drift, and speech slur. All right, next we have anaphylactic shock, which is a severe allergic reaction. So this could be to any number of things in the dental office, and hopefully you've, again, gathered a comprehensive health history from the patient and you know what they're allergic to. So I love this acronym because it's so easy to remember, A-E-I-O-U, all the vowels in the alphabet. This stands for albuterol, epinephrine, at a 0.3 milligram dose, which is the dose of an EpiPen. So you administer an EpiPen, IM antihistamine, you give them oxygen, and I cheated a little bit here, and so it's not you specifically, but it is you call 911. So A-E-I-O-U. All right, and I saved the best for last, anticoagulation. So a patient who is undergoing anticoagulant therapy, say they have a cardiac shunt placed or they have a history of DVT blood clots, they need to take anticoagulant medication that limits or controls the tendency of blood to clot. 
and lead to serious complications like stroke and heart attack, the things we've just talked about. So I have two great videos on the platelet pathway and the coagulation cascade. If you want to learn more about those complex processes in a more simplified way, I'll leave a link to both of those videos in the description if you're interested. So the big thing with these patients is to first ask them what medication or medications they're taking and what they're taking them for, and then make sure they have results from these particular blood tests so you can decide if it's safe to perform something like a tooth extraction. So a CBC is a complete blood count, and this tests for the number of blood, of blood cells. So this would be testing if a patient had anemia, low red blood cell count, leukopenia, low white blood cell, thrombocytopenia, low platelet. Bleeding time. In reality, it's not that useful of a test, but the theory is that bleeding time is a time required for blood to clot and is increased in disorders of platelet count. So platelet function is tested with bleeding time test. So aspirin is an antiplatelet drug. It's not an anticoagulant. So it will affect the bleeding time, but it will not impact PT, INR, and PTT, which we'll talk about in just a second. So aspirin is an antiplatelet drug and is good with bleeding time, but does not impact the other three tests. So PT tests for the extrinsic clotting system. And so this would be a great test to take on a patient who's on anticoagulants. They have liver damage from alcoholism, or they uh, have damage or deficiency of vitamin K because they're vitamin K dependent clotting factors, which are involved in the extrinsic clotting system. So all of these things are intimately related to this PT time. So that test would be appropriate for these sorts of patients. INR is probably the most important thing on this slide, and it's a standardized PT test. So it's normalized for different lab materials, essentially. So INR stands for International Normalized Ratio, and it's done for patients. It can be done for these above scenarios, but it's mostly done for patients on warfarin or coumadin. Again, the same drug, just different names. So a patient who is taking warfarin or coumadin, again, for the same examples I may have talked about before, they need anticoagulant therapy. You get an INR value if you're taking these medications. INR a normal INR is 1. If you're higher than 1, you're a bleeder. If you're lower than 1, you're a clotter. So for a therapeutic value, you want to be between 2 and 3. And you want to be not much higher than this, because otherwise you're going to have too high a propensity for bleeding, which can be a problem if you're trying to do a tooth extraction. So some people say that less than 3.5 is okay for an extraction or implant placement, but I would remember 2 to 3 for the board exam. Again, this is the therapeutic level that's not too high of a propensity for bleeding. So this test needs to be done for patients on warfarin. And I remember because INR are the last three letters, granted in a different order, the last three letters of warfarin. So warfarin functions by blocking reduction recycling or production of vitamin K. So vitamin K is low, and then those certain clotting factors that depend on vitamin K can't function properly. And so you don't want to take out teeth on a patient who cannot clot. That's a recipe for disaster. So that's the whole reason we're so concerned and and valuing these blood tests so much. And lastly, we have the PTT, which tests the intrinsic clotting system. 
And so this is done for patients on heparin, which is popular in uh, renal dialysis patients, and patients who are impacted by hemophilia, which will impact the clotting factors of the intrinsic pathway. And so the times of all these tests will increase when on an antiplatelet or anticoagulant. So we need to make sure the patient is able to clot effectively in order to support doing certain dental procedures. The last thing I wanted to include in this video are the four G's. These are four herbal anticoagulants to remember because these can be prescribed or used in patients and they can also impact some of these tests. So to remember that they have some anticoagulant function is useful for the board exam. All right, everyone, that's it for this video and this video series. Thank you so much for watching. If you're interested in supporting the channel, please check out my Patreon page. A huge, huge thank you to Michael Raja, Ainz Lau, and David Jaden, and all of my patrons for their support. You can unlock extras like access to my video slides to take notes on and practice questions. So go check that out. The link will also be in the description. Thanks again for watching, everyone. I'll see you all in the next video.